Hello and welcome to our February 2024 Bible q and I'm Pastor Paul from Calvary Chapel, Ontario, and I'm here with my wife, Sue, and we are here to answer Bible questions that we've been getting from you. They've been coming in through our YouTube channel. They've been coming in through email sent to our office. They've been coming in. You grab some from Facebook sometimes too, don't you? Do I? Yeah, well, I saw that oh, there was one that perhaps. said from Facebook. So, sure. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, wherever else a, a question might pop up, sure. uh, we add them to the list. And this is our time to uh, just sit down and respond to some of the things that are on your heart. So we're looking forward to answering some some good questions that we have this this yeah, time. Yeah, and I find it interesting to. Um, uh, see what people think about and what they're interested in. Absolutely. It's very, very interesting. It, so it's, it's very we'll eye-opening. It is. Sometimes. We'll start yeah. with Thomas. He says, hi, Pastor Paul and dear Sue. In Genesis 6, 6, the Bible tells us that God regretted creating man. Mm -hmm. How can you explain this concept of regret in relation to God telling us in the New Testament that he has chosen or foreknew us before the foundation of the world? May God bless you for what you're doing. You know, this is a good question, but I, I do have to tell you that whenever the Bible uses human words, which, well, what else is it going to use right. to describe an emotion or a response of God? We have to take it in stride mm -hmm. because God is not like us. And we have to remember that we are limited in the way that we can communicate the emotional responses and the, the actions of God. We have to use people words to describe someone who's not a people right. from the standpoint that he's being like us. Mm -hmm. He is a person, of course, but he's not a human being from the standpoint like us. And so what we have to do is we have to, these words are actually called anthropomorphisms. We refer to God or speak of God using words that we would normally use to describe things that sure. we're feeling. Um, it's interesting that um, the word regretted is used. The ESV uses that. The latest revision of the New American Standard Bible says the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth. Mm -hmm. And that's probably a better rendering mm -hmm. just from the standpoint of helping us to understand what's going on. But the thing we have to remember is that there was nothing about mankind's tumble into sin that took God by surprise mm -hmm. or shocked him in any way. So any word that might be used in the Bible to describe his response, we should not assume to be uh, uh, expressing a limitation mm -hmm. on, the, right. on the part of God himself. Yeah, that makes sense. I suppose when it says, and God was angry with them, or when he says, I am a jealous God, those are other examples of what you call anthropomorphisms. Well, and especially in light of the fact that, that we have to remember things like jealousy, we would normally think of it as a very negative sort of an right. emotion. And God has no sin. There's no darkness mm -hmm. in him at all, the Bible says. Yeah. So obviously his jealousy is very different from ours. Sure. Yeah. All right. Austin says, Pastor Paul, can you comment on other non-canonical books such as Enoch, Jubilee and Giants? Are they books you have studied? I have not. I don't take any time at all with any non-canonical books. Uh, you know, um, there are 66 books in our Bible and I'm still working on getting a handle on those, even after, you know, teaching them and reading through them as, as many times as I have, mm -hmm. I'm still figuring out things that's written there. And I don't feel like I have the, the time and the energy, frankly, to invest in books that aren't uh, inspired and part of our biblical canon. Yeah. Yeah. Simple as that. All right. A YouTube user asks you, is it acceptable to seek the favor from a known wicked or sinful man? My concern arises because I require assistance for college admission. My father has approached an influential individual for recommendation who doesn't seem morally upright to me. That's a good I, question. It is a good question. And I can understand this person's, you know, hesitance to, to do that. 
And, you know, the Bible does issue some warnings uh, along those lines. Proverbs 22, 7 says the borrower is the slave of the lender. And uh, in Proverbs 23, uh, it says, do not eat the bread of a selfish person or desire his delicacies. And you could probably carry that into the whole idea of don't desiring what belongs to him. You know, it goes on to say, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. And uh, so I, I think that there are ample biblical warnings that could be taken into consideration. And and, and I think if, if this person is 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 getting a, a a red light warning from the holy spirit then he should heed it sure yeah. it's it's further complicated by the fact of honoring his father here <laughs> well, who has an idea it is. of one way moving forward I'm and so it, it needs to be prayed through it does i'm assuming the person that wrote is an adult himself mm. and in that Perhaps. sense as an adult that there there's a different dynamic that comes into play mm -hmm. you know if he were if he were a, a young man under his father's roof and under his father's authority in that in those early ages i would say well just do what your father wants and and you know but if he's a if he's a grown sure. man in his own right he has the ability to just to speak into the situation right okay bethany says what does the bible say about there being babies in heaven the bible doesn't say anything now you shouldn't take that to mean that that when the Bible doesn't say anything, the silence on the part of the Bible is not a comment. Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't comment based on silence. Sure. We simply say, and th that's the answer to this question, the Bible doesn't say anything about babies in heaven. I think a lot of people wonder, what about children, you know, that, that died in childbirth or died very soon after mm -hmm. or even died immediately before childbirth or something yeah. uh, like that are, are there going to be babies in heaven well again the bible the bible does not say okay yeah alex wants to know are pagan gods demons because first corinthians ten twenty, the apostle paul said the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons not to god and i do not want you to be participants with demons you know the answer to this question is yes and no because and, and, and i hate to be <laughs> ambiguous about it but the answer is yes and no what is behind pagan deities are demonic spirits right. i don't think the people who worshiped those pagan deities knew that or would even have believed that or even today i don't think they would mm -hmm. believe that they truly believe there are there's the God of the sun and the God of the moon and the God of water and the God of fertility. And you know what I mean? Because yeah. the pagans had a God for everything and, and for everything a God. But, but, but Paul reminded us there, as this person quoted you know, from 1 Corinthians, that, that when people offered sacrifices to, to uh, anything beyond the eternal God who has revealed himself in the scripture and, so, and, in, and in nature, that those things go to demons. There's just kind of this natural sort of a default thing that if you're not addressing the God who is the one God over all, that then demons get involved in receiving that uh, sacrifice or worship or whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. So again, the answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. All right. Norman Jeffrey says, Pastor Paul, where do demon spirits come from and where do they get their power to torment? Well, um, this is one of those interesting questions that we have to kind of piece together, you know, from reading the Bible. And we have to, and there isn't just one little or two little spots that says, mm -hmm. all right, now we're going to talk about the origin of demons. Um, we learn things as we look at the whole counsel of God's word related to these things. And we believe that, that, that demonic spirits were once angels, um, and, and, and one of the reasons we believe this is that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, there's a statement speaking of the dragon, who is, which is a, a symbolic reference to Satan. And it says, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And of course, m you know, many people, myself included, believe that that is a reference to the fallenness of some of the, the, the angelic uh, spirits 
who were created by God to be good, but who rebelled along with Satan and were cast out of heaven. And then in, in that same chapter of Revelation down in verse 7, it says, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels mm -hmm. fought back. So that's just a few verses away from this symbolic reference to the dragon sweeping with his tail some of the, and taking some of the stars of heaven. Stars being a reference, a symbolic reference there to angels. And then the other reference we have, frankly, is um, uh, words by our Lord Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, where he says, Then he, and speaking of the Lord, will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. Once again, there's that mm -hmm. reference there. And so it is, it is believed from these passages put together and others that demonic spirits or demons, if you will, unclean spirits, as they were called in the particularly often in the New Testament, uh, are former angels of God who followed Satan uh, in his rebellion. As to where they get their power to torment, um, they're angels, they're powerful beings. Mm -hmm. they, they have innate abilities, which we don't know a lot about, frankly. Yes. We just simply know that man was created a little lower than the angels. So the angels have one up on us uh, if it were not for, you know, the power of God and the name of Jesus Christ in our lives. Don't you think that uh, culturally it is possible to tamp down on the power of the demonic spirits. For example, when the gospel began to spread, yeah, yeah. there was quite a battle for a, a number of years. Yeah. But then as the certain um, uh, countries really embraced the gospel, I, I feel like the, the demons kind of lost some of their power. And by the same token, as the world gets farther and farther away from biblical Christianity, right. we're seeing a rise yes. of you know, demonic power mm -hmm. and authority and influence right. in the world today in which we live, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul told us would mm -hmm. happen in the end days, that that f people would follow teachings inspired by demons. And that's right. what's happening today. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, an anonymous uh, YouTube user says, is Calvary Chapel, Ontario, a reformed church, and does it embrace reformed theology? Good question. No, Calvary Chapel is not reformed, and we do not embrace reformed theology. I'm aware of the fact that there are probably a good number of people that don't know what reformed theology is, and, and, I, would and I don't really have time to get into all of it, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to say two things. First of all, for those of you that don't know, I would encourage you to just to look into it. You can, you can Google it. What is reformed theology? Mm -hmm. But secondly, I would caution others who do know what reformed theology is not to jump to conclusions, because when I say Calvary Chapel is not reformed, from that standpoint, there are people who will instantly jump to the opposite sure. and they will say, oh, then you must be then right. this. Mm -hmm. And usually that, that, that describes some polar opposite of reform theology, which often is Arminianism, mm -hmm. which we are not yeah. uh, either. So it, it's, it's uh, one of those things you have to be very careful about because it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a label. Right. It's a title mm -hmm. that people have used to describe a particular form of theology, which, you know me, I don't like titles. I don't like those sorts of things. But I, I do know that they, do, they can at times serve a purpose. But um, yeah, we just have to be careful not making assumptions. That's and good. I would encourage people, you know, just find out what Calvary Chapel uh, does teach sure. rather than trying to label it and put it into a particular bucket. I'm happy for your answer because I thought for a moment you were just going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> and just leave it at that. But you're a teacher, so that would never happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay, John well, says, I've been seeking God's will and direction for several months and have not been able to determine God's will. Heaven seems silent. That is a really good phrase. I think people can resonate with that. Sure. He says, to hear a pastor or teacher or lay person say, God is always speaking, we're just not listening, is very discouraging. Can you shed any light on this? And are there any scriptures that state God is always speaking? 
Yeah, it is a good question. And I can shed some light. I think when people say God is always speaking, they they may forget to um, elucidate exactly what they mean yeah. by that. But I and I and I, I agree with it. I believe God is always speaking. And here's a scripture that proves it. Hebrews 412. The word of God is living and active. Mm. It's not inactive. Mm -hmm. It is active. It's sharper than any double edged sword piercing the division of soul and spirit, da, 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 you know the rest of the passage. The, the Bible is constantly speaking to us. And I think one of the reasons people refer to God as silent when they say, I'm praying about a particular decision or right. thing in my life, but heaven is silent or God is silent, it's because they're expecting, they have an expectation mm -hmm. of God speaking to them in some predetermined specific way that they've just decided this is the way I'm expecting it to happen. And when it doesn't happen that way, they say God is silent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I believe that what we need to do, especially during the times when we're seeking God for a particular answer is that we need to just be living in the word mm -hmm. and, and, and allowing that word to minister to our hearts in, in such a way that as we're consuming it and digesting it, that we hear him speaking to us. Yeah. Every time you read the Bible, God should speak to you. I'm not talking about an audible voice, but I'm talking about the Holy Spirit right. confirming mm -hmm affirming and sometimes directing yeah. through his word. And we all love those times when we're going along in life and the Holy Spirit just taps us on the shoulder and says, you know, from his Holy Spirit to our spirit, here's the direction, here's what I want you to know, whatever. Those things have happened rarely in my Christian life. They've happened but they've been rare. If I were to put all my eggs in that basket of God's communication, I would probably be disappointed a lot of the time, or I would come out with the same response this person did. God is being silent. Yeah. But when you are immersing yourself in the word of God, you're opening the door for heaven to speak in ways that are just wonderful. So I would really encourage this person, just be consuming the word right now. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Uh, George asks, other than Leviticus 19, what does the Bible say about tattoos? The Bible doesn't say anything about tattoos. And in fact, the reference that George is referring to in Leviticus 19 really isn't talking about modern tattoos at all. Because what God was forbidding in that particular passage mm -hmm. was his people, the Jews, taking a tattoo, which was um, part of pagan worship practices. And so it was he was specifically forbidding them to uh, follow the, the ways of the pagans, if yeah. you will. There were lots of things the pagans did that God said, don't do that. Don't be like sure. them. Mm -hmm. So um, Leviticus 19 is not saying, don't go get a tattoo that says mom on yeah. your arm. <laughs> now, I'm not a, you know me, I'm not a big tattoo fan. Right. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I think under, under the new covenant as a, as a New Testament believer, um, I think that we should simply recognize that our bodies are not our own. We've mm -hmm. been bought with a price. And if you're thinking about getting a tattoo, I think you should consult the Lord about it and ask him. He, he purchased the body that you have yeah. through the blood of his son. And uh, you should talk to him about it. All right, Denzel says, I've read your first book. Pastor, I have a question. Cool. When is the second book coming out? Well, the first answer to that question is hopefully soon. I'm, I'm hoping by this summer we're going to mm -hmm. be able to uh, publish a second book. And it's not going to be another question and answer like the first one. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Although I think some at some point people would like uh, round two, volume two, because they have a lot more questions oh. <laughs> than pages well, in the first book. Maybe, but maybe then so. he also said, my question is about the fruit of righteousness mentioned in Philippians 1.11. Is this the same as the fruits mentioned in Galatians 5? Or is it fair to say 
the fruit of righteousness is just another name of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe it is just another name for the Holy Spirit. The passage he's referring to, if you back up a couple of verses, is Philippians 1, 8 through 11. Uh, Paul writes, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Here's where he says it, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Some Bibles actually translate that the fruit of your salvation. Mm. And so I believe, yeah, I think that there is a direct correlation between the fruits of a person's righteousness or the fruit of their salvation and essentially what Paul describes in Galatians 5, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of that spirit-filled life mm -hmm. and the fruit of what should be shining through our lives right. because we are children of God. In many ways, the word fruit could almost be exchanged with the word results mm -hmm. because even in nature, the result of a growing season of a fruit tree should be fruit if there's health to it. The result and of a fruit tree should be fruit. Should be fruit, yeah. yeah that should be the result yep. if it's healthy. Yep. And so... The Absolutely. same in these kind of yeah, for sure. phrases. Okay, another anonymous question. The internet is buzzing lately about the question of whether or not a believer should attend a same-sex marriage ceremony. What are your thoughts? Usually people ask this, and I've gotten this too. Sure. And usually people ask this question when they've been invited to a same-sex right. ceremony. Can I just tell you that that's not the time to try to figure this out? <laughs> You know, that that's going to really put a lot of pressure on the situation because, you know, you're going to you're going to give considerations in areas that 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 are going to potentially sway you in a direction that you may not ultimately want to go. These are questions that every Christian should think about um, beforehand, yeah. before any sort of an invitation comes. However, I tend to think that rather than asking uh, should I attend a same-sex wedding? I think there are other questions that need to be answered first, such as um, what is a wedding as it is defined in the Word of God? Because, you know, mankind did not come up with the institution of marriage, nor, nor even the, the, the coming together uh, of a man and a woman in marriage. So, you know, that's the first thing we should think about. So since, since God came up with it, he defines it. What is that definition? Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, what does God's word say about same-sex relationships? That's You have to ask yourself that question. What's the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Uh, number three, do you believe that a same-sex wedding is legitimate and lawful? Okay. Well, that's going to affect your decision to be a part of that. Uh, number four, what does my presence at a same-sex wedding communicate to the couple or to anyone who might be in attendance mm -hmm. what does that say about me what is it communicating about my beliefs yeah. and so forth and then um lastly since we all know that weddings are a celebratory occasion we come together to celebrate the coming the the joining right. of of two people in in marriage we have to ask ourselves the question, how do you feel about being part of the celebration of a same-sex couple? Yeah. So those are questions that, that need to be answered. Mm -hmm. And then I think once you work through those questions, you're going to be able to arrive at your own conclusions sure. as it relates to the initial question, should I attend mm -hmm. uh, a same-sex Those are some ceremony? really good questions to break it down. Well, you need and, to break it down. Yes. Otherwise, it becomes an emotional decision. Right. And that's what you don't want. You don't want it to be a purely emotional decision mm -hmm. because we weren't, we weren't told in the Word of God to, to, to live our lives on an emotional level. Right. Uh, because, I mean, emotions are part of us. Don't get me wrong. But if we live on an emotional level only, then, you know, the Bible is not going to truly be our guide. Our emotions will be our guide. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Thomas says, I love to listen to your Bible studies on the BSF, which stands for Bible Study Fellowship Passage that we study weekly. Mm -hmm. My question is, even though Jesus and the Holy Spirit are equal with God, is there a hierarchy in the Trinity? 
I ask because of this verse and others. And then the quotation is Philippians 2, 8 and 9. And when he was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death, death on a cross. So God raised him to the highest place. Yeah, yeah. Um, I appreciate him putting in the quote because that does help me to understand his mm -hmm. question. Yeah. So he asks the question, is there a hierarchy in the Trinity? And I would come back and say, it depends on what you mean by hierarchy, mm -hmm. okay? Because people could have different uh, definition for that word. If by hierarchy, you mean, is one person superior to the other persons of the Trinity, then I would say, no, there is no hierarchy. If, however, by hierarchy, you are referring to one or more persons of the Trinity adopting an attitude of willing submission, to the other, which is what you see sure. in the passage there in Philippians, then yes, we do see that kind of relational hierarchy mm -hmm. uh, in the Bible. Jesus humbled himself, right? But he did it willingly. God the Father did not humble Jesus. The Holy Spirit did not humble Jesus. Right. That passage in Philippians makes it very clear. He humbled himself. And so... Um, there is that willing attitude or action of of humbling and submitting mm -hmm. oneself in the in the uh, in the Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Georgie says at the end of your teaching on Genesis 32 to 33, you spoke of believers trying to work out their own issues instead of waiting on the Lord. Uh, but how do we know when God expects us to take some action on our own behalf? Oh, you know, we, we get this pretty often, the old challenge of what sure. does it mean to wait on the Lord? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, I think, I think this is an almost universal uh, question, mm -hmm. don't you think? Sure. I mean, people struggle with this and they've wondered, you know, what does it mean? What does waiting on the Lord look like? Right. You know, and I have kind of come to learn that waiting on the Lord is not so much a cessation of activity necessarily on my part. It's an attitude. Mm -hmm. It's an attitude of my heart, uh, you know, toward God. Waiting on the Lord for me means really putting my heart in a place of submitting to his will. It doesn't mean I'm just going to sit around and wait for the phone to ring or I'm going to sit around and wait for a door to open. I might, I might even be busy wiggling knobs to see if a door unlocks. Sure or making phone calls and seeing if there's something there. Waiting on the Lord means whatever does happen, I'm going to submit to him. In other right. words, I'm giving God total veto power and I'm giving him the, 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 the freedom to redirect my path mm -hmm. at any time he chooses. So to me, that's what it means to wait on the Lord. I'm waiting for your will. I'm waiting to see your will play out in my life and that again that doesn't mean i'm sitting on the couch right um i'm 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 doing what i'm supposed to be doing i'm occupying until he comes and i'm 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 moving around in my life expecting the lord to lead as i move you know isn't it interesting? These two questions are right together. You just kind of expounded on Philippians chapter two. He humbled himself and became obedient. Yeah. <laughs> and you're almost giving the same answer here. That's it's true. not a cessation of activity, but rather it's a humbling yourself in your activity yes. and becoming obedient to what the Lord has. And he will stop you or cause you to start running or yeah. whatever. It's it's Philippians two, eight and <laughs> yes, it is. And you know, this is this is one of the biggest areas where I think Christians struggle in their understanding of what the Bible says and, and, and what the Bible is saying to believers is that we try to distill it down to a, an action when it in fact it is a heart attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, God looks to the heart. And um, so we have to remember that all the time. It comes down to a heart yeah. attitude a heart posture before the Lord. All right, Jack says, we're told that there will be peace on earth during the millennial kingdom. Yeah. Yet we're also told there will be people on earth during that time that will have a sinful nature. And he referenced Zechariah 14. 
Mm -hmm. There seems to be a contradiction. To me, peace on earth means everyone behaving and getting along. No crime, murder, etc. But if there will be sinful men on earth, won't there still be crime, murder, etc. during the millennial kingdom, thus negating any true peace on earth? You know, it's a, it's a well thought out question because he's right. During the millennial kingdom, there will be people who are mortal. Uh, they will have a sinful nature. And they will be living and propagating on the earth during uh, that 1,000 year period. You got to remember about two other very important facts about the millennial kingdom. The first one is Satan will be bound during that time. Mm. So Satan is not going to be around influencing in the same way that he is currently. And secondly, we have to remember that Jesus himself will be personally ruling and reigning on the earth during the millennial kingdom. Mm -hmm. There will also be a huge population of people living on the earth during the millennial kingdom who don't have a sinful nature. Right. Because there will be people who have, will already have experienced the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, although, you know, not everyone. So there's going to be an unprecedented peace Right. So During, talk about a culture that tamps down on oh, demonic oh, influences. <laughs> you know, we've seen we've seen the body of Christ in in this age um, come to faith and create huge influences in culture. Right. You know, there there are uh, stories of some of the revivals in England that were so widespread and so profound, the police had nothing to do. Right. And they mm -hmm. would go around singing like barbershop quartets <laughs> because, you know, they were just, there was, there, yeah. the crime was so, you know, tamped down, as you like to say. So imagine what it's going to be like during the millennial kingdom when Satan is bound, Jesus is on the throne. There are people living uh, among others who do have a sinful nature, who don't have a sinful nature, creating that godly influence. And it will, in fact, be a time of unprecedented peace. Now, mm -hmm. we know that by the end of the millennial kingdom, Satan will be released and will deceive the nations one final time. But remember, he has to be released in order to affect that deception. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, it, yeah. It will be like nothing we've ever experienced. It, and so we bingo. can't, we can't know. Perfect yeah. way to say it. Mm -hmm. Wilma says, my question comes from a discussion that a few friends had. Some are curious about the new Bible translation, the Legacy Standard Bible. What are your thoughts? I am aware of the Legacy Standard Bible. Um, and I've even looked into it a little bit. And I know that it exists. I am, I got to be honest, I'm a little confused as to why it exists. Not that I have any problem with people, you know, or organizations uh, coming out with another Bible translation. I, that's fine. We do have a lot of them. But what's interesting about the Legacy Standard Bible is that it is published by the Lockman Foundation. Mm -hmm. And the Lockman Foundation is also the organization that publishes the New American Standard Bible, which is an excellent Bible translation. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the Legacy Standard Bible, if you go to their introductory information on the internet, they will tell you that uh, the Legacy Standard Bible is essentially a retooling, for lack of a better word, of the New American Standard Bible revision of 1995, which was, has been a very long-standing revision. Um, somewhat wooden in its or, or, or you know in its in the way it reads but still a very good translation yeah. so the legacy standard bible is a retooling of the 1995 nasb well in and 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 by the way the legacy standard bible came out actually in 2021 okay all right in 2020 the lockman foundation published the new american standard bible 2020 revision which just was about time. It had been 25 years. Sure, sure, sure. No problem. But you know, both the 2020 revision of the NASB and the Legacy Standard Bible both say that they are a revision or a retooling of the NASB 1995 for the purpose of modernizing some of the language, making things more clearer and becoming more accurate. Yeah. They both say the same thing. So within a one year time, the Lockman Foundation got behind the 2020 NASB and the Legacy Standard Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, 
The only real difference is that the Legacy Standard Bible is also being supported by some other people sure. other than Lockman Foundation, mm -hmm. such as John MacArthur right. and others. Mm -hmm. And that might be one of the reasons that they decided to go ahead and, and publish this additional Bible translation that I think is really very similar to the NASB 2020, which I like, by yep. the way. Mm -hmm. They did modernize the language and, and they took away some of the rigid reading style mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. New American Standard Bible. Um, and, and I think they came up with a, a, a really good translation of the Bible. That's why I struggled to know why they felt the need to do yet another. Maybe giving it a name. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, Who's to know? <laughs> maybe so. Maybe, maybe somebody can write to me and tell me what the reason. Maybe they know more and they yeah. could explain it to me. All right. Well, Perry says, 1 John 2, 1 says, it's possible for believers to sin and be forgiven when we confess it to Jesus, who is our advocate. Yep. But what happens to believers who know their sin is wrong, but still continue to sin, not wanting to be made right with God? Okay, he says, what happens to them? So does he mean when they die? Or, I don't know. Or what? Ha that's right. You yeah. don't know uh, yeah. because he didn't specify. Yeah. What happens to them in life? Mm -hmm. What happens to them? What is their life like? Yeah, what's their life like? Yeah, like? yeah. yeah. and maybe yeah. those are two good ways to answer it. Well, rather than doing that, I prefer to go back and simply ask the question, how is a person saved? Because you see, when you, when you really nail that down, then you understand that if a person, if you, if, if a person dies believing that Jesus Christ paid his or her price sure. on the cross for his or her sin, then they're saved. Even if they were living ridiculously, rebelliously, stupidly, if they die in faith, believing in their heart that Jesus died on the cross for them. They're going to be saved. Right. All right. And, and so, and do you know who that's really important for As I think about the people who have, um, stubborn to them sins. For example, let's say that a born again believer yeah. believes that their cigarette smoking habit is wrong. Yeah. They believe that for them that is sinful. Yeah. And yet, it is so stubborn inside of there. It's just very difficult. So it's very important for them to have this hope that you're talking about, that it wasn't getting rid of it in the first place that got them saved. Right. You know, right. we, and so, so when we think about sin, you know, the, there are some sins that we, we would want to cast off. We're working on casting them off. Maybe that's not what they mean. They know it's wrong, but they continue. But there's some stubborn things that you know it's wrong. You believe it's wrong. And yet you're continuing in a frustrating way. You know, Christians struggle with the idea of salvation by grace through faith. Let's yeah. just face it. They yes. struggle. They, they know that they are saved as a free gift from God. But what they struggle understanding is, how can I continue to mess up? Or how can my uncle, right. <laughs> who confessed Christ, and I believe he really truly opened his heart to the Lord, and he invited Jesus into his life, and I believe that he believes that Jesus is the Savior, and he died on the cross for him. However... Right. Uncle Bill or Jack or Bob, whatever, you know, he had these issues in his life or he he ended his life the last five years living kind of rebelliously. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is, did did Uncle whoever, did he did he die with with faith? Did he died believing he's saved? He's born again. Mm -hmm. he, the point is this. The, the presence of sin in the life of a believer does not nullify their salvation. That's what, what, what yeah. believers struggle accepting. Sure. It's, it's, it's because you have to understand something. If I'm saved by grace through faith, but I lose my salvation because of works, mm -hmm. then you boil that down and, I, and, and I'm saved by works. Yeah. It, just, yep. it comes down. It's, if it's, if it's works on either side, then it was, it was salvation by works. Mm -hmm. So, and we don't believe in salvation by works. We're right. saved by grace through faith and this not of ourselves, you know? The next question is a companion from a different uh, viewer. Can you explain through God's word how sin cannot separate you eternally from God, but only relationally? And they probably hear me talking about that sure. a lot, mm -hmm. you know, how sin as a believer separates us, can separate us relationally from God where there's a distance. 
uh, and we need to repent and, and make it right so that our relationship is restored. But I have said many times that when you sin, that's not going to cause you to lose what you have been given because you're going to continue to sin. You're going to mess up mm -hmm. you're go and you're going to you're going to feel horrible about it. You're going to repent. You're going to go back to the father and he loves you and, and you know, he will forgive you. But in Romans 8, 1, a couple of passages in Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, you know, Paul is making a, a statement here that if you are in Christ, and that means my confidence is in him and his finished work on the cross, there is no condemnation any longer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist because Jesus bore my condemnation. Mm -hmm. And then later on in that same chapter, Paul goes on to, to do that very famous passage where he says, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, height, depth, you know, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So those are some biblical references to explain that just because I continue to mess up, I'm not going to be separated eternally. That sin no longer has the power. And the reason is, is because the curse of sin has been broken in my life because Jesus became a curse for me. Right. The curse of sin is death and separation from God. Mm -hmm. If I, you know, if, if that, if my sin causes that curse to come back, then that means my sin was more powerful than what Jesus did on the cross to break right. that curse. You're such a good explainer. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob says, Pastor Paul, thank you for your channel. What is the difference between the gift of prophecy and someone who says they are a believer but claims to have a psychic ability uh, to things that come true or using astrology as their source of power? If somebody says that they are a Christian, but claims to have psychic ability or claims to use astrology as their source of power, I would stay as far away from that person <laughs> as I could because yeah. those two things are diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody who has a gift of prophecy receives insight about situations, sometimes insight that comes before the event takes place, but not always, mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit. Right. A psychic or someone who is, who is using astrology is using man-made slash demonic mm -hmm. means mm -hmm. of knowing or predicting. Yeah. So you're talking about the difference between something that comes from God and something that comes from Satan, the sure. enemy. Yeah. That's the difference. I think the uh, the picture is really clear. You know, we're we're in First and Second Kings in our women's Bible study, and you know the prophets are speaking for the Lord, but so many of the kings wanted knowledge through divination. Yeah, and so they would go to these other they sources. They opened to themselves yes, to those sources because, and who knows what their motivation was? Yeah. Maybe they wanted the same thing that the prophets had, but it wasn't their lane. So yeah. they head over to these other areas yeah. from from the demonic sources. Yeah, it's very dangerous. Hey, uh, Fred says, hi, Pastor Paul and Miss Sue. Thank you for this great study method through the entire Bible. Here's my question. Are there people gifted to interpret dreams like Joseph was in Genesis 39? That's a really good question. Um, I, I do have to say that interpretation of dreams is not listed by the Apostle Paul mm -hmm. as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, having said that, God can do whatever he wants to do. If God wants to uh, open up the meaning of a dream that he has given to someone, uh, he can certainly do that. But honestly, I would be very dubious of anyone who came to me and said, I have a spiritual gift of interpreting dreams. Sure. The reason I would be dubious is because it's not listed in the Bible as a spiritual gift. Again, I think mm -hmm. it's possible for somebody to be given an ability, but yeah. it's not listed as a spiritual gift. Mm -hmm. So... Amara asks, what is a lukewarm Christian? Are they born again? <sighs> okay. First of all, the, <laughs> the term lukewarm only occurs once in the entire Bible. That's in the book of Revelation. It's in uh, the letter that Jesus dictated to the church at Laodicea. Yeah. And you know what he basically said there. Um, he said that they were lukewarm. They were neither hot nor cold. And that is the definition, you know, of, of lukewarm, even in our culture. If I'm running water from the faucet, I say it's lukewarm. It's not hot. It's not cold. 
in biblical terms, it didn't just mean slightly warm and not, not really, but not really cold. Yeah. In biblical terms, lukewarm meant useless mm. because in ancient times, people either drank cold water or hot water mm -hmm. and they did not consider lukewarm water to be useful and they would spit it out. And so that's one of the reasons why Jesus said what he did to the church at, at Laodicea. However, I have to go back to the question. And the question is, what is a lukewarm Christian? All right. If the person is genuinely a Christian, and, 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 and the question is, are they born again? There's no such thing as a non-born again Christian. Right. Okay. Yeah. If we're going to really be technical. Exactly. Now, mm -hmm. Somebody might say, well, Pastor Paul, are you saying that somebody can't claim to be a Christian who really isn't? No, I'm not saying that. Somebody can claim to be a Christian and not be born again. Nat says on YouTube, I often listen to music that I know is Christian by context, but is sung in a language I don't understand. I find that because I don't understand the language, I feel a greater spirituality than when I hear music sung in English. Is my musical preference unbiblical? Well, it's not really unbiblical, I, I would, mm -hmm. you know, in a, in a strict sense. So this person likes to listen to Christian music in a language they don't understand. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I would say that if you can't understand the words to the song that you're hearing, you also can't apply the message uh, in your life. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I mean, you can use music to worship the Lord and that worship can come from within you. But there's really nothing in the music. I, I, I guess I think what Christians have to do is you have to be careful about putting feelings here as kind of the... Um, the, the, the quintessential barometer of whether or not I think this is good or bad. And that's what this writer says. Nat says, um, I, I, I feel a greater spirituality. Well, just because you feel a greater spirituality doesn't mean that listening to music that way is more spiritual. Um, the real question is, does does it change the way you live? Because the way you live is what makes you a mm -hmm. spiritual person. How you live. If you're, you know, we talked earlier about that life of righteousness, the fruit of righteousness, mm -hmm. that's spirituality. Sure. It's not how something makes you feel. Yeah, So good. Uh, Sicily, hello from England. I enjoy watching your videos on YouTube. I was wondering, is it selfish to pray to Jesus to return soon, given that so many people are, remain unsaved? I appreciate this question because, you know, Sicily understands from the scripture that God uh, is delaying the return of, of Jesus for that very reason, you know, yeah. because uh, he, he wants none to be lost. But, you know, the heart cry of, of the body of Christ is is come. Yeah. You know, the book of Revelation ends by saying the spirit and the bride say, come. Mm -hmm. There's a cry inside of us. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I don't think there's anything wrong at all with 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 even praying, Lord, come soon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's our heart cry. Sure. We want we want to see our savior. We are the bride. We're longing for our bridegroom to appear. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, who wouldn't? What bride wouldn't long, you know, mm -hmm. for the bridegroom to appear? Robert says, is the term kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven interchangeable? They are. They are interchangeable. Is that the question that you're going to say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my quick response. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good. Yes, they are. Well, then Grace says, hi, Pastor Paul. I had a question about communion. Does the Bible explicitly say we must confess our sins before taking communion? And must the confession be to a priest? I am Ethiopian Orthodox, and unless we are children or the elderly, most churchgoers don't take communion because we are not considered pure. I wanted to understand the Bible's view on this. Thank you very much. Wow, that is a different perspective than yes, my world. Yes, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, okay, first of all, let's start answering some of these initial. Does the Bible explicitly say we must confess our sins before taking communion? No, it does not. Uh, must confession be to a priest? No, there is no reference in the Bible uh, that that confession must be made to a priest. The Bible tells us that we have one advocate before the Father, and our advocate is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. All right. So the the need of a of a, a third party is not required. Um, 
the misunderstanding that not only you know Ethiopian Orthodox have related to communion and um, the, the 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 worthiness you know of an individual taking communion those are all references that are taken from Paul's letter uh, to the Corinthians and he did talk to them about the fact that during their love feasts there were people who were ignoring others who were uh, who had less let's put it that way okay so he said some of you are over here in a corner you know during this love feast gorging yourself and there are others who who had little or nothing to bring and you're not sharing you're not considering the body mm -hmm. um you're over there drinking wine and practically to the point of drunkenness and somebody else has nothing else. And, and, and the love feasts of the early church were, were intertwined with their celebration of the communion table. And so they were kind of considered to be one, one thing. So what Paul said to the Corinthian church was, this is why some of you are sick because you have not taken into consideration the body there there isn't that kind of love and care among you he said some of you are sick and some have even died mm -hmm. all right so the natural conclusion of people who like to generalize things mm -hmm. in the bible is that if there's anything in our hearts that is in any way out of shape or 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 wrong you better not take communion because you're liable to drop dead. <laughs> well, that's just simply not what the Apostle Paul was saying. Yeah. You know, the fact of the matter is none of us are worthy. Mm -hmm. And all of us struggle in the areas of sin. Listen, before they, they begin to, to serve communion, if you just go before the Lord and said, Lord, I know my heart is not right with you all the time. So I, I lay my heart before you, even as they're passing out the communion elements or however it's done in your church. I just, I ask you just to forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, Lord, just show me the areas of my life right. where I need to, mm -hmm. you know, to be right. And I, and I know that through the blood of Jesus Christ, my, I, I stand righteous before you. And then just go ahead and take communion, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Paul was not forbidding people to take communion unless they're worthy because nobody yep. is worthy. So just, hey, just prepare your heart before you take communion Understand that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. And by all means, take communion. It was meant to be something that we participate in. Sure. He didn't want to. Paul wasn't trying to scare us away from participating right. in communion. <clears throat> Very good. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> an anonymous person asks you, what Bible program do you use for studying and what kind of computer do you have? Oh, what a fun question. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it's a good question because I, people will, will write to me from time to time and ask me to recommend some good commentaries. Right. And I never see the cover of commentaries because I don't have them in book form. Mm -hmm. They're in digital form. They're on my computer. I use Logos Bible program uh, for my study of the word. I love it. It works great. You use it too. I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we really enjoy it. And we've been using uh, Bible programs for years and years and years. And we've amassed a pretty big uh, yeah. library, digital library. I think that we have That takes something. up no space. Well, it takes up just this that, amount of space right here. Yep. And I never have to dust them. And <laughs> it's fantastic. Although you like books. I for do. For even display. I do like books but, a lot. But anyway, uh, the point is... We have a digital library of probably over 1,100 resources mm -hmm. right on our laptops. And so, you know, Logos isn't the only one. There are free Bible programs right. mm -hmm. that are available. In fact, I would encourage people, if you're kind of low on cash, uh, just Google it. Free yeah. Freeware Bible programs. Mm -hmm. um, there are some that are online. There are some that you can download. Um, there's some great ones. And, and I would encourage anything that really aids in your study of the word. And um, as far as the, the, the kind of computer I have, um, I, I work primarily off a uh, MacBook Air, um, but I also keep up with Windows computers. And I got to say, just because people asked about it, my favorite operating system of all to work with is Chrome OS. It's not Mac OS, it's not Windows, but it's Chrome OS. I love Chromebooks. And uh, just because it's so simple, 
and you don't have to worry about viruses <laughs> yep, that's and true. stuff like that. So uh, you're, you're using a Chromebook right here. Mm-hmm. This is a Pixel book, which they don't make anymore. Right. Uh, this was one of Google's uh, early versions of a Chromebook, mm-hmm. but we're still using it. We love it. It works great. Yeah. We both teach I, from... I picked this up for my son. Yeah. Who was we casting both, off. We both teach from a, a Chromebook. <laughs> right. Uh, we study on our uh, different laptops. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. So there you go. All right. Mm-hmm. That's you, fun. You I don't, don't mind to get to doing talk tech about talk. Tech. That you was don't fun. Mind. Hey, more questions on tech. <laughs> I'd love that. Because that's a, a nice diversion. Well, here's our last question, again, from an anonymous viewer. I've heard much debate on who the sons of God were in Genesis 6. I know the Bible does provide further references to the sons of God that would seem to point them as angels, but I know that's also debated. In a nutshell, why should we care so much about knowing exactly who they were? Thank you. Man, I wish more people would ask that question, (laughs) that last part there. Does it really matter? Why should we care? You know, that's so good. Most of the time, the questions that Christians debate, I would refer to as dancing on the head of a pin. Yeah. And and it honestly, the answer to the question simply doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We ask a lot of questions just for pure curiosity. And this is one of them, you know, the, the, the reference to the sons of God in Genesis six, some people say, yeah, those are angels. Some people say, no, they were godly human beings. And there's this debate that rages on. And I, I talk about it. And if this person wants to know what I think they can go to my study in Genesis chapter Mm six, wasn't that long ago, right? We did that because Mm -hmm. we started over on our fourth study through the Bible. Um, and you can, you can hear what I have to say on it, but, um, the answer to the question is, why should we care so much knowing exactly who they were is, is spot on. There really isn't a reason other than being able to say, this is my side of the debate. Uh, it truly doesn't matter. Now, mm-hmm. some would say, well, but it plays into why things took place. Like, for example, many people who believe that sons of God refers to angels, they believe that that is the reason for the great wickedness that sure. then produced the flood or or caused God Mm -hmm. to deluge the the whole earth and kind of start over again with the family of Noah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see where you can connect the dots, but it still doesn't matter because the flood still happened, whether Mm -hmm. it was because that humans caused it or that fallen angels were involved in that process. The flood still happened. We still then, you know, came from Noah and his family. And, and, and it, it, in the final analysis it doesn't make a heap of difference. You know, I kind of feel like if a person were to say, what are the top 100 things that I should understand from the Bible? That's all I got space for <laughs> is the top 100 that's, things. That's your hard drive limit? Yep, that's my storage limit. limit. And that probably wouldn't be in there? No. So I'm good. You know, it's funny, but I, you, I wrote a book that has over 150 questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I wonder how many of those would fall under this category. We should do that. You should do that. That should be one of your future books. The top 100 things to know about. That don't matter. Or the don't matter. (laughs) (laughs) That would be easy. The top 100 questions that don't matter to your salvation. (laughs) There you go. It's a plan. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. But I I appreciate the question. I really do from this, uh, this person that wrote in. Does it matter? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Uh, Just a reminder, I did write a book in case you want to get a copy of it. It's available on Amazon. You can search for it. It's called Pastor, I Have a Question. And uh, that came out about a year ago or so. And um, uh, it it does cover over 150 uh, questions that came in just the way these came in. And and I answered them in book form. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the last time uh, that I'm going to see you here for a few days. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you take off on Monday for Germany to uh, teach at a women's retreat. Just tell us very quickly. Retreat this weekend. I'm super happy. Some of the Calvary chapels in uh, southern Germany have gotten together. They haven't had a women's retreat for five years. And some of these young to me women have just, um, you know, 
put themselves out, ask the Lord to, you know, really bless the ladies with a, a good women's retreat. And so it's a great worship leader coming and I get to share the word. And now you're flying I, into Frankfurt mm -hmm, yeah. and then the, the retreat will be uh, in the Heidelberg area, Heidelberg mm -hmm. area. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And I yeah. bet you're looking forward to that. I am. I, I am. I don't get out of the country very, very often. And yeah. so it's always such a blessing to be in the body of Christ in a different culture, a different area. I mean, even in a different language. In this case, there will be yeah. a translator. And um, and I think it just is a real blessing to have that sensation of uh, seeing this, the body of Christ in a different expression yeah. and seeing really how big the Lord is, how big the spirit of Christ is throughout the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more about it when you get yep. back. Yep. Thank That'll you. be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I'm stocked up on soup <laughs> and, and there's some ramen and, and there's some chicken and rice in the and freezer you for you. froze some chicken mm, and rice for me. So I'm, I'm, I did I'm, my job. I'm expecting to survive <laughs> this, th this nine day, fast no it's it, i'm fasting from my wife yeah but, <laughs> but excited about it and, and that sort of thing hey thank you so much for joining us today hope we uh answered some questions and maybe put some issues to rest in your heart if you have further questions we'll be gathering them up to have a march bible q a one of the best ways to to do that is to email us mm -hmm. at the office, office at ccontario.com. And we will combine, uh, compile those questions and uh, be back here toward the end of March to do this all over again. So until then, Lord bless you. Have a good rest of your day, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.